This topic will be covering plate tectonics and we'll be covering numbers 2, 30, and 31. Good morning, class. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about four different types of maps that you may see. And so the first one is the depth of the sea. And so on the side here, it has a key for like meters. And so, for example, and you can use this key to like determine what's on this map. And so, for example, like right here is purple. So you're going to find the purple that's on this map, which is right here, which is 3,500 meters below sea level. And on the map, you can see how it goes. Um, it starts at zero and then goes below zero, and then it goes bigger than zero. And so any colors that are above zero that you see on the key that also match up with on the map, that's gonna be um, taller or like larger um, in size, like from sea level and up. And then anything below zero you see, so like this teal going into this blue and purple and magenta, that's gonna be below sea level. And so that's how you can determine the different depths of the sea across the map. So next we're going to be talking about volcanoes. Yes, Charlie. Miss Stephanie, what do the red dots represent? Good question. So the red dots represent the different places where volcanoes are in the world. And so on the side over there, it says that the red dots indicate currently or historically active volcanoes. And so as you see, there are some spots on the map that only have like one or two dots. And then there are other ones that have like a whole bunch of dots. And those usually fall on the fault lines of plate tectonics. And you guys remember what those are? Yes, there are plates that can move side to side. One can, um, they can be convergent or one like subducting the other. And so that's where we get plate tectonics is because um, where there are more dots on the, like just slightly off the fault line, that means that the ocean, which is right here, is subducting the continental plate, which is right here, and that causes um, eruption in like volcanoes that way. Good question. All right, our third poster today, class, is about the seafloor age. And so these different colors represent um, different ages of the rock. And so on the side here, you see it goes from red, green, blue, and then colors in between. And so the red represents the newest rock, which is around like um, 9.7 million years old. And then the dark blue, which is right here, there's a couple of spots over here, right there and over there, they're just scattered throughout the map. That means that it's 180 million years old, which is hard to believe. And so all of these rocks are like of the seafloor are, so that's all rock. And so they are either on or slightly off the boundary line of the plate tectonics. And so that can cause the plate tectonics to do different things depending on um, other like um, things that are also happening like in that spot. And so the seafloor does have an effect on plate tectonics. And so that's this poster. All right, class. So for our last poster that we'll be talking about today is a seismology map. And so this map shows different um, earthquakes that occur around the world. And so where you see the red dots, which are a lot right here, those are zero to 33 kilometers. And for um, 
the orange it's 33 to 70 kilometers then green is 70 to um, 300 kilometers and then the blue which are scattered like throughout the map those are 300 to 700 kilometers and so there are three types of different things that can happen at plate boundaries. Yes, Charlie. Um, Ms. Stephanie, do earthquakes occur at convergent boundaries? Yes, they do. So during convergent um, boundaries or at those, those are when the plate tectonics, the plates come together and hit. And so that causes like the shaking of the earthquakes. And this is where majority of um, earthquakes occur. And now um, the other one of the other types is called divergent and this is like the spreading of um, plate boundaries. And so there are just a few um, earthquakes that occur there. And then um, transform, there's not a whole lot of earthquakes and that's where the um, plate boundaries like rub against. Majority of them happen at convergent because of the colliding. And so around here, you can see that the earthquakes, like where the dots are, kind of outline the fault lines of the plate tectonics. And so you can see where um, a lot of them are. A lot of them are like right here, but there are um, some that just like follow the fault line or just slightly off. And so that's it with all the posters today for Plate Tectonics. We'll be covering ecosystems and <clears throat> it'll cover numbers 14, 16, 29, 34, 37, and 39. All right, class. Today we are going to cover a couple different topics. The first one is an ecological niche. So does anyone already know what this is? or have heard it before, a couple of you, okay. So basically an ecological niche is kind of where an organism fits into an ecosystem. So this includes um, like what role it plays in the ecosystem. Um, it also is like the type of food the organism eats where it lives, where it reproduces, and how it acts with other organisms. So that's kind of like a summary of what that is. And so our next topic is resistance versus resilience. These may sound a little intimidating hearing these words, but I'm gonna clear that up for you. So resistance basically um, for example, if there is a forest fire that happens in a community, this resistance um, will impact the community just slightly, so which is the forest fire. So the forest fire will slightly affect the community, basically. So, and it's um, impacted by just like slightly by a disturbance, so not huge. And so what will happen is that the forest fire won't completely uh, like destroy the community. It would just be affected slightly. And then we have resilience. So if we take the example of a forest fire again, say the forest fire comes and uh, comes on this community. So these com types of communities recover quickly after disturbance. So the forest fire won't have longing effects on the community. It will just happen and then the community will build up to back or back to its original state. So that is that topic. Our next one, we're going to be talking about producers in ecosystems. So a producer, for example, is this flower. 
And so what happens is that the light energy from the sun will shine down on the flower and then the flower will absorb that and um, photosynthesis will take place, which is when plants make their own food. So the flower will do that and then the flower will release oxygen into the air and that is um, uh, like the air that humans breathe. So that's kind of like a cycle that happens through that. Our next topic, we're going to be talking about organisms. And so these are your producers, which we briefly just touched on with the flower. And then we have our primary consumers, our secondary consumers, and then our tertiary consumers. And so let me give you a scenario. Say if copper somehow got into a plant, okay? Um, then a deer comes along and eats the plant, it will also consume part of that copper that gets spilled on the plant. So eventually, after a while, a fox, for example, will come and consume the deer, which has the copper in it. So the fox is really consuming the deer and the copper. And then again, after a while, say a bear comes along and consumes the fox. It will also consume copper since it's, the copper is basically passing on from organism to organism. And so in the end, the bear will be greatly impacted by the copper since it's been being, or it's being passed on through the organism. Next, we're going to talk about ecology. So ecology, as you can see up there, is the branch of biology that deals with the relations of organisms to one another and their physical surroundings. So there are four different types of ecology. There's community, ecosystem, population, and psychological. So we're gonna to touch on each of those types just a bit. So the first one is a community. So a community is a group of various species living in a common location. Um, for example, plants, animals, fungi, and bacteria. There are communities in our environment that all of these live in the same area. So they would be living in a community since they're living in the like same location. The next one is an ecosystem. So this is where living and non-living organisms live. And so here's a picture. There's some water and a tree log and deer and birds and plants. And so this is just an example of what an ecosystem would look like. And then our third type is a population. And so this is a group of the same organism that live in the same place at the same time. So for an example, deer, there are populations of deer that will like move with each other. And so other examples may include bears or birds or fish. And so basically they're the organisms that just like stay together and that's like a population of organisms. So our last type is physiological. It's kind of hard one to say. Never say it together. Physiological. physiological. Good job. Oh, I see you dabbing back there to me. Good job. Okay. So this is where the organisms have to adapt to where they are living. So this is a picture of water. 
So if an organism wasn't used to living by water, they're going to have to adapt both behaviorally and physiologically. And so um, this way they will be able to survive and root, uh, reproduce successfully. So those are just some topics to cover today and we will get into deeper discussion on those. Next I'll be talking about soil and plants and this will be covering numbers 1 and 12. Okay class, so we are going to be talking about plants and soil. So this is a diagram of a basic structure of what a plant looks like. So we have the roots, the stem that goes all the way up, the different leaves, then there's a little uh, seed right here, and then at the very top is the flower. And so the soil, which this is a picture of soil, is all beneath this line. So the roots are all woven into the soil. So when you're at home and you're watering your plants in your garden, the water will seep into the soil and then the roots will absorb the water and then it will go all the way up through the plant and into the leaves and into the seeds that are coming off the stem and to the flower. And so the soil is made up of air, water, and other minerals. And so as the plant is growing, it is using those nutrients from the soil, not just from photosynthesis, which we talked about earlier, but also through these minerals, and it will get its energy or the food from that too. This topic, I'll be talking about cells and it will be covering numbers three and four. Okay, class, now we are going to talk about two different types of cells. And believe it or not, there are two. So the first one is an animal cell, which we all have. And so this cell is more rounded. And so there are, or there's a nucleus, which will hold the DNA. And then the cell membrane will protect the cell and let things in and out of the cell. And then we have the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. So it'll take in nutrients and break them down and create energy. And then we have the cytoplasm, which is like the jelly-like substance in the cell, holding everything together. Next, we have the plant cell, which is different than the animal cell. And so there is a nucleus in the plant cell, which again holds the DNA. And then the mitochondria, the powerhouse, so you can remember from this one. And then the vacuole holds the nutrients and water together. And then the cell wall will protect the cell from other things around it. And then the chloroplast will allow for photosynthesis. And then cytoplasm, as I said before, is the jelly-like substance inside the cell holding everything together. So those are your two cells.